Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to the URQFC conference uh, today. Uh, you'll see that on uh, Zach's screen, he is sharing uh, the schedule for today. Uh, so you'll see that our first event uh, will be algorithmic strategy development and Q&A uh, with Zachary Lee, who is the co-president of URQFC. Uh, I'm Joe Smith. I am also a co-president of URQFC. Uh, you know, Zach uh, is a dear friend of mine. Uh, he's one of the smartest people I know, uh, and he is very passionate about quantitative finance and trading. Uh, so without further ado, here is Zachary Lee. Thank you. Thank you for the intro, Joe. And um, it's an honor to be here uh, presenting in front of everyone, uh, especially people from clubs all over, the, all over the world. So the purpose of this presentation is to give you um, like a rough overview of what it takes to develop a quantitative investment strategy why it can be so powerful. And then we're going to have um, Joe going into some more details on developing more technical models. And Arez is going to talk more about using machine learning and more complicated alternative data sets. Um, but I thought I would start with a more introductory like overview of what is a quantitative strategy, essentially. Um, so this is what a, a quantitative strategy looks like at a high level. Um, and then I'm going to like show you an example of how to create one. So usually in finance, uh, the first step will be data reduction. So you're going to have a lot of data. This could be financial data. This could be um, so-called alternative data. This could be fundamentals, for example, price to book ratio, price to earnings ratio of different stocks. Uh, and basically, we need to create um, some entry and exit criteria. So if you look down in the center section, we, we need to create entry and exit criteria based on this data. So we reduce the data to the most valuable parts, and then we enter and exit different investment securities based on some sort of profitable algorithm. We calculate our order size, and then we end up sending that order to the exchange. You also have sort of an error handling aspect, um, just in case something goes wrong with the order sending. But one thing you'll notice about this um, schematic is it's very, it's very circular. So uh, this is a continual process. You know, at many times per second, this process can occur as new data comes in from your data source. Uh, all these calculations will begin again. Um, so that could be something that's very powerful. So let's dive, uh, let's do a little bit of a deeper dive into, in my opinion, uh, the two most interesting parts of a quantitative investment strategy. Um, and those are the entry and exit criteria. So most of these other blocks besides these uh, will not change appreciably uh, depending on what strategy that you may use, but the entry and exit criteria will change uh, every single time. And quantitative research is essentially the idea of developing core trading algorithms that lead directly to trading decisions. So the other uh, blocks here don't change, but the entry and exit criteria will change Constantly. So what I'm going to show you how to do is how to create good entry and exit criteria from your data sources. That's kind of um, the bread and butter of being a quantitative researcher. So let's talk about entry logic. We have our data source. From our data source, we need to create uh, models. Now models is kind of a vague term. This could be um, a technical indicator or a rule. So we have a rule based on our data set that causes us to make an investment. Um, however, this could also be, as Erez will get into like later on, this could be a machine learning model instead. Um, so once we have our models, th that will serve as an input to a filter. So we're going to take a financial market and we're just going to sort of uh, apply some sort of model to that market. And if the model meets a certain condition, we will look to take a trade. That's kind of how simple it can be to develop an entry rule. And this is kind of very similar to what uh, you know finance majors or people uh, doing investment will do, right? They'll have sort of philosophy and investment philosophy, will, which will often be based on some sort of investment rule. Like I'll only look at companies that are quote unquote uh, undervalued, right? So imagine trying to code that philosophy uh, into a sort of entry logic. And at the end of the day, we need to get to a price. So we need to enter at a price. Um, so usually the model will sort of sort of spit out a price that will be our entry price. 
and also the exit logic. So once you enter an investment, you also need to decide at what point you will exit it. And this is actually, in my opinion, more important or at least equally important to when you will enter the investment. And I'm gonna show you an example uh, of how dramatically uh, changing the exit logic will affect the performance of a trading strategy. Uh, so here again, you will have your same data source. You may have the same, you may use the same model, but likely you'll use some different models for deciding when to exit. Um, and then the two most simplest ways of exiting are, you know, a stop loss. So if a trade is going against you by a certain amount, you will exit it. Uh, similarly, you may have a trailing stop. Um, and then that will generate an exit price. So I'm just going to stop, uh, stop the slides for a second and go into like some real code and do like a, a coding demo, essentially. Uh, just give me one second. Okay. So I'm going to show you like, like a real quantitative investment strategy, uh, one of my more successful ones. So let me share, um, share the code for this. And this will be like available to download um, afterwards. So you can see here, um, going along with the philosophy of most of the blocks that create a quantitative trading strategy do not change. Only uh, sort of these few lines here um, regarding uh, the long entry filter are going to be different from strategy to strategy. So let's take a look at this. Let's say we want to uh, make an investment in a financial asset. What it's checking to do is saying, have we recently made an investment? Um, and then it's also saying, do we already have an investment? So essentially this particular strategy will not enter in the same market at the same time, multiple times. And that that's just to prevent uh, sort of a very undiversified exposure. So these two don't really matter. They're not anything important for this strategy. Uh, they would be there probably in every strategy. And then here we have uh, the investment logic for the entry filter. So if you remember, we're trying to get to an entry price, but first we have a filter. Uh, so in this case, it's saying uh, if the if the the price goes below, and then we have a call to get indicator value. So all this is saying is if price financial asset goes below two standard deviations from the mean. That's basically what this line means. And if you look below here, you know we have some more code about the details of how to open a position. But just note, uh, in this case, I've chosen to not provide uh, any exit logic. So we don't have a stop loss. Um, this is sort of a very simple rule that says if price goes below two standard deviations, we're gonna enter a long position. And if it goes above, we'll enter a short position. So you just see this switch. So this is a very simple rule. So let's take a look and see how this strategy will behave. Um, so we can, what we can do is we can take this code and sort of simulate how it would behave historically uh, on a financial market. And feel, by the way, uh, feel free to put questions in the chat, like as you think of them, and we'll do like a quick uh, sort of Q&A session at the end. Um, so what I'm going to do now is run a test and show you like how this strategy performs. So you can see uh, sort of over a, a frame of time from 2006 to 2019, even with such a simple rule, there is some profitability. However, it's not very impressive. Um, you know, we started with 10,000. Uh, dollars of equity in our account, it goes up a little bit, and then you can see a stagnation for five years at the end. So this is not um, anything super exciting, but don't forget we have not implemented, you know, the exit rule, um, which is potentially a very important part of what, what would make the strategy perform better. So what I'm going to do now is start making some changes um, as if I was developing this strategy for the first time. Uh, so let me see here. So the first thing that we need to do um, is that we need to, instead of opening the order at the market price, we will open it at a slightly different price. Uh, so let me go ahead and make that change really quickly. Uh, pardon me one second. Okay, so here we're looking at the open price, but I'm gonna change this um, slightly. So basically what we're gonna to look to do is we're gonna to look to open this order at the value of another model. So we're using 
uh, sort of another indicator, as I mentioned before, to, to set the open price. Um, so what we're going to do is we're going to look at a linear regression. And there's basically a few variables we're using here. So these are all things that can then be optimized later in the strategy development process. But for now, we'll just input these. So this is a linear regression, linear regression shift. And then we're going to multiply a another model called bar range. And we're going to multiply that by a variable, which could also be optimized later. And finally, we'll have bar range shift, which is another variable. So what is bar range here? Bar range is a volatility measure. Um, so depending on how volatile the asset uh, that you're using the strategy on is, that will depend that will change how far you the open order is from the current market price. So if the market is very volatile, we will want to open farther away from the market price when we send this order to the exchange. So just a little change. And we'll just go ahead and uh, use the same logic for a short position or for a long position, pardon me. Um, so let's just go ahead and change this, change our open price. And if you let me make one other change as well. So let's go ahead and add a let's go ahead and add a stop loss to the strategy. So what we're going to do for stop loss is we're going to make the stop loss um, this this value. So this just says we're going to get a stop loss, and it will also be based on volatility. Um, so instead of having no stop loss, we have a volatil volatility based stop loss on this strategy. Let me go ahead and make that change. Um, for for the for the short stop loss as well, so we're just going to change this, and let's just see what what changes what changes in the test, and let's also take a visual look at how the strategy is behaving. Zach, we can't see the test by the way. Cool. Um, that's cool. Let me let me try this. Let me let me change sharing really quickly. Okay, so this is this is like a visualization of this strategy in action. So let's see what, what's going on. So if you look at the the top lines here, these represent two standard deviations from the mean. So we see that if price goes above two standard deviations, we have entered that sell position. You can see that a, a sell trade has been placed. And then you know, as time will sort of continue forward, we're maintaining that position and then it will close it. So this is kind of how the strategy works. But notice that we also have these stop losses being added now um, based on how volatile the market is. And you can see on the bottom, the indicators that represent volatility. So the higher these would be, the more volatile the market has been in the recent past. So this ATR 50 and the ATR 39. Um, so, you, so you can see that in this case, a sell order was placed again, but it hasn't been filled yet. Because the market was very volatile in this period, um, the order was placed farther, the entry price was farther away from the current price, um, sort of like we made that, that code change. And so it requires a little bit more downward price action before uh, it will enter the trade, but you can see that it has now entered the trade. So that's sort of an example of how it behaves in the short term. Let me go ahead and uh, sort of reshare uh, the test and see what happens. So. Uh, one second. So I'll just change this to sort of a single back test. And you can see like the strategy is performing way better now. Um, it's a dramatic improvement, in fact. So before uh, it had made it to about 60,000. Uh, now it will take this $10,000 investment and it will be over $2 million by the end of, 20, of 2020. Uh, this is a strategy that I developed first in about 2016, and I've been using it ever since. Um, so it's, it's pretty well, pretty good performing. Uh, the sharp ratio is slightly under two, which is not bad for a one hour strategy. Um, so the final thing that I will do um, with this strategy. So if you remember, there's one other block that we need to determine the exit price. So, so far we have a stop loss but we're not covering for the situation where a trade will get very, very profitable and we want to lock that profit in. 
And to cover for that situation, we have what's called a trailing stop loss. So by trailing, uh, that means that a stop loss will follow the current market price around. So as you have more profit, that profit will be locked in. And let, let me just, uh, and I'm showing you an example of like what a trailing stop loss will do. But I will say I would I use a trailing stop probably in the majority of my strategies because it will always, almost always will help you. Um, and just looking at what 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 it's using, it is again using average true range, which is a volatility measure, and shifting uh, lowest in range. So basically, it says, "Let me take the lowest price we've recently had, and add something to that, and that will be the stop loss." So that kind of makes sense. But we can uh, let me show you what it what it will actually um, do. So if we run a single test. Uh, this is the final uh, version of the strategy that I use um, uh, in my quantitative live portfolio and as well that, that I use in the trading competition. So here's what it here's what it looks like. So you can see like it's a lot smoother and mainly uh, the large downsides in the uh, previous back test are removed. So if you remember that very sharp decline that happened, that's kind of been removed. And that kind of makes sense because we're constantly updating the stop loss. So instead of placing one stop loss and forgetting about it, the stop loss is always moving. Every hour, the stop loss will move. And that's an example of something that a quantitative strategy can do um, that a human will have trouble doing, constantly moving a stop loss by a set rule. And that kind of gives a major performance advantage here. Um, so yeah. That's just kind of an example of a strategy in action. Um, pardon me, one second. So, yeah, let me just go ahead and switch this. Apologies. Yeah, so there we've shown like how to use a stop loss, how to use a trailing stop loss to generate an exit price. Here's an example of what happens when you have many uh, quantitative strategies working on the same portfolio. So each line is an individual strategy and how you can benefit by having many strategies um, is by identifying strategies that have low correlation. So if you look at my portfolio, most strategies are not highly correlated to each other and that provides a lot of diversification advantages. Um, to conclude, I, I believe that uh, quantitative investing provides you an opportunity to have superhuman performance in the investment industry um, because you can take advantage of opportunities that no one else can. You can use uh, backtesting and historical validation to optimally size your trades and you get to spend your, your day on tasks that machines cannot yet do, which helps you future-proof your career as opposed to um, spending most of your time doing uh, manual analysis um, that's a lot less efficient. And finally, you can have a, a massive and also directly measurable impact on the bottom line of the company that you're working for, uh, which I think is very critical. Uh, so I just want to say, uh, give a thank you to Joe Smith, who is an upcoming presenter, uh, Christopher Sanchez, Dominic, Shireen, uh, Stuart Kaliani, Erez, and many others. Um, who have either helped me become better quants or helped organize this event. <laughs> uh, and here's like my contact info. Feel free to to reach out. I love to to field questions and help every uh, help people on their quant journey. Thank you very much. Thank you, Zach. That was an awesome presentation. Uh, if anyone has any uh, questions uh, that they'd like to ask, uh, please do so now as I pull up uh, a quick word from uh, mix uh, from MMI, uh, the CEO of MMI, and she will she has a five minute excerpt that she would like me to share with everyone. Um, Shereen and Zachary, thanks for having me at the conference today. My name is Kirsten Wagner. I am Chief Executive Officer of Modern Markets Initiative. We are um, an organization founded by four of the leading automated trading firms, GTS, Tower, Quant Lab, and Hudson River Trading. 
I'm based in Washington, D.C., and my job is to track industry trends, uh, meet with members of Congress, um, SEC, and the administration just to educate on the benefits of electronic trading. Um, and it's really nice to meet, be with you guys. I'm pre-recording this session for a couple minutes as I definitely wanted to be able to make it, but I'm joining virtually and I'm happy to schedule follow-up virtual meetings with any of you who want to learn more about kind of what I'm doing at Modern Markets Initiative. But I'm going to pull up a quick screen share with some slides I put together. Um, you can see here, Modern Markets Initiative was founded in 2013. We um, do a ton of educational outreach on the benefits of the industry of automated trading, creating jobs. There are over 2,400 people employed by our organization in over 50 markets globally. As we look at you know, how the markets have evolved, so you see a picture here of the floor-based traders from the 1980s movies. We all know that that is no more. Now, if you go to a stock exchange, you're gonna see um, a lot of computers um, and a very electronic trading floor. So we have seen that gravitation from floor-based trading to electronic trading. And I understand you all have a high level of interest in automated um, trading. So I'm gonna give you a little bit of a snapshot on some of the benefits of um, automated trading. Here you can see that over time, the bid ask spread has um, shrunk for retail investors. So you see the average cost of trading go down by over half over 10 years. This yields 30% more savings for retail investors um, over lifetime savings. When we look at what has happened during the coronavirus, um, the electronification of the markets um, has really helped uh, keep things um, working in a remote uh, climate. The floor-based trading certainly would have not been able to happen during COVID times. Um, so in a way, it's very beneficial that we have this all electronic marketplace. And as we look at some of um, the volatility that has happened over this year, you'll see um, that there were tremendous spikes in volatility that were comparable or higher to volatility in 9-11, um, 08, Great Financial Crisis, or Brexit. Uh, one of the messages MMI has had to Treasury and the Federal Reserve is that um, automated trading, high-frequency trading, has had a tremendous benefit in providing liquidity to the markets. Um, that liquidity has been especially vital in times of market volatility. As volatility goes up, the demand for liquidity um, increases as well. The last thing you want to have is a drying up of liquidity and um, wider bid-off spread. So what we saw was the automated traders stayed in the markets. Um, and so I'm gonna go through a couple more slides here. Here you see a liquidity ratio, the demand for liquidity going way up during Q1 um, COVID um, times. And here you can see uh, more data on the dependable liquidity of high frequency traders, that even as the volatility went up, you can see as a percentage of market liquidity, the percentage of high frequency trading participation and liquidity provision actually increased in those times of volatility. So I'm going to wrap up my screen share. I'm happy to um, give all of you more data and information on the benefits of automated trading. I want to thank Shireen for um, inviting me to speak with you guys. And um, one plug here, MMI has um, this year completed its first fellowship of um, really quant majors and mathematicians were interested in analyzing the markets. We offer a summer fellowship again next year. So please reach out to me if you're interested. We'll be posting that um, opportunity probably in Q2 of next year. Um, but I would love to learn more and get to know you. If you have any questions about automated trading industry, feel free to reach out to me. Again, I'm Kirsten Wagner, Modern Markets Initiative. Uh, you can reach me at kwegner at modernmarkets.org. Thanks so much. Have a great day. Well, I'd like to thank uh, Kirsten Wagner for, uh, you know, giving us that short excerpt. Um, as of right now, I think that I will be moving into my presentation. So today, uh, you know, again, my name is Joe Smith. Um, I am, you know, co-president here at York UFC. Um, and, you know, one of my main, well, I guess my primary research focus in quantitative finance uh, that I've discovered, uh, you know, over the past year or so, um, is digital signal processing and fractal geometry. And I'll get into why, you know, I find these useful for trading. Um, but, you know, this, this whole presentation is essentially um, go going to be somewhat of a guideline um, between, you know, bridging, you know, more of the, I guess, theoretical, mathematical and statistical concepts into, you know, uh, an evaluable and tradable model. Um, 
So like, obviously, if you're interested in, you know, any particular uh, branch of mathematics, statistics, et cetera, and, you know, you're curious how they would apply to markets, uh, you know, this presentation will obviously um, be useful for you. So moving forward. Um, so Zach was mentioning technical analysis and technical analysis is really just, you know, using historical price and volume data, uh, you know, or transformations of such. Uh, to essentially uh, generate predictions of future market activity. And I'm sure a lot of you, uh, you know, have taken basic investment and finance classes and have heard of something called the efficient market hypothesis. And so the, efficient market, the efficient market hypothesis uh, is something that's, you know, taught, you know, universally uh, to undergrads. Um, however, in my opinion, uh, it's kind of uh, almost entirely discredited by the inherent existence of quant funds. Um, and the reason being that, you know, there's three forms of uh, market efficiency, according to this hypothesis. Uh, weak form would indicate that, you know, historical pricing data uh, has no influence or predictive value uh, in terms of the future. Uh, Semi-strong form, uh, you know, specifically relates uh, to publicly available information. So essentially it's saying that, you know, prices are, um, you know, everything, uh, all public information is currently priced into an underlying asset. Um, and strong form uh, would also wrap in private information. So, you know, the whole point of a quantitative hedge fund existing uh, is alpha generation. And you can see on the chart on the left, uh, you know, this breakdown of alpha generation and what it really means. Uh, you can see on the x-axis, uh, you see the return on the market minus the risk free rate. And on the y-axis, we see the return on the portfolio minus the risk free rate. And I just like to point out here that um, the intercept of this uh, plot uh, would be equivalent to the alpha of the said the underlying portfolio, right? So, however much uh, the portfolio returns in excess of the underlying market. So now getting into fractals and scaling. Uh, you know this animated GIF here. I hope it's not too distracting. Uh, but what it's picturing is something called the Julia set, and the the transformations that you're seeing, the motion, are a result of essentially changing uh, one or two uh, constant values within this equation. And what's really special about the Julia set is that it's infinitely complex at scale. And what that means is if I were to zoom in to the edge of this fractal uh, infinitely, uh, you would see that there is actually infinite complexity um, no matter how far I zoom in. And you know, the comparison that we can draw to pricing data is you know, people would like to think that uh, you know, pricing data is some kind of continuous waveform. Um, but in reality, uh, it's often discretized. Uh, you know, the existence of candlestick data, right, open, high, low, close, um, is essentially uh, reducing, you know, thousands and thousands of points of data down to four different points of data. And this is true for every scale that you evaluate markets at, right? So you can look at, you know, hourly candlesticks, uh, daily candlesticks, weekly candlesticks. Um, the point is that every candlestick is an encapsulation of much larger um, amounts of data. So I'm going to uh, talk about a lesser known market hypothesis, a lesser taught market hypothesis uh, known as the fractal market hypothesis. And the underlying uh, crux of this hypothesis is that alpha generation uh, can be achieved through rigorous and unique analysis. And this would be, uh, you know, in coordination with, uh, you know, modern quantitative funds. Um, and essentially, you know, what this gets at is that at every scale, um, there is different equilibrium, uh, equilibria that the price uh, is moving towards. And if you do such you know, rigorous and unique analysis, uh, there's potential reliably um, you know, performing that arbitrage. Uh, and you know, one major uh, component of this fractal market hypothesis is that at every scale, um, pricing data is either within a cycle or within a trend, right? So a cycle can be defined as you know, accumulation uh, and then dis uh, distribution, right? So buying and selling or selling and buying. Uh, and a trend can just be defined as, you know, trending upwards, trending downwards, or trending flat. So we're going to get into the effects uh, that, you know, this kind of uh, definition of the system has uh, when you're actually evaluating it. So I'm going to uh, throw out some words here that may seem uh, somewhat intimidating. Uh, but if we want to, I guess, define this underlying system as a, uh, a fractal uh, geometric object, uh, it would be important to understand the spectral density of the underlying system. And what that means is essentially, um, if you think about a sine wave, right? a sine wave, say, of period 10, 
Um, and you know, you just have this continuous wave moving through time. Uh, the spectral density would essentially be um, a graph of the periodicities uh, versus the amount of times that periodicity has appeared. So if we think about random motion, right? So Brownian noise, if you've heard of it, um, Brownian motion describes um, a, situ a, a random system in which uh, price is equally as likely to go up as it is to go down. Um, and you know, a lot of uh, you know, quantitative models are, are you know, based on uh, you know, normal distri uh, normally distributed values, uh, the Black-Scholes model, for example. And I'm not saying that it's not a useful abstraction for market data. However, what I am saying is that it doesn't actually fully describe uh, the underlying system. And you know, one important thing to uh, point out is that economic, economic data behaves more so like a natural or a natural system or organism than it does a random walk. So a natural system, you know, such as, I guess, uh, COVID cases or uh, population growth, or you can name a you know, vast other number of things. But essentially what I'm getting at is the existence of uh, the persistent existence of chaotic cycles. Um, you know, this is actually showing us that, you know, this has been uh, shown uh, repeatedly um, in you know, uh, fractal geometric research that the uh, spectral density of market data is much more similar uh, to pink noise than it is to brown noise. And you know, what this ties into is essentially uh, resistance and support theory, right? Uh, maybe you've heard of it, but you can see here that uh, you know, prices can also often be observed um, to be uh, having inflection points at values that have been uh, inflection points in the past, right? So we would call this long memory of the system. Um, and that is something uh, that would not be uh, consistently observable uh, if this underlying system was in fact uh, brown, brown noise. Okay, so main, mainstream technical indicators, um, you know, some of, uh, some of the ones that Zach were discussing, uh, Zach was discussing, um, in my belief are non-optimal. And that's for three reasons. So number one, uh, modern technical indicators often incur too much lag, right? So in digital signal processing, this would be called the transfer response. And the more data that you're inputting to this filter, uh, the more lag that it's going to generate. And we'll get into all of these topics individually um, after this, but just a brief explanation. Um, another uh, problem with mainstream indicators is they don't account for something called spectral dilation. And you know, this ties into that whole uh, scaling aspect of prices, where you know, at every single scale, uh, prices are either cycling or trending. But you know, what often traders are, are not privy to is the fact that at, at any observable scale, uh, the cycles and trends that are happening above and below are actually influencing the measurement that you're taking of the current time period. Um, you know, essentially this comes up as uh, what would be referred to as aliasing noise, right? And we'll get into that further later. And the third main problem uh, with technical ind indicators, uh, arguably the biggest problem, is that often technical indicators will assume a constant periodicity. And what that means is, if you're familiar with technical indicators, uh, say that you're using an RSI, um, relative strength index, which essentially measures the ratio of closes up to closes down over the past X amount of bars. So often uh, traders will say, oh, you know, I, I use uh, 10 bars, uh, you know, that's worked for me historically. Uh, 10 bar RSI is the best. You know, however, uh, you know, there is this concept that um, essentially uh, that cycle period is actually dynamic. Um, you know, if you're measuring, so say if you had an RSI of uh, length 10, that would mean that you're estimating the dominant cycle period to be 20, because essentially what you're trying to do is pinpoint those inflection points on a cyclic um, motion. So getting further into smoothing uh, and lag, uh, you know, I've, I've listed a few conventional techniques that are used for data smoothing. Uh, and, you know, the primary use of uh, these smoothing formulas is to maximize uh, noise reduction and minimize lag. Right, so the simple moving average, uh, many people have heard of this. You basically take the last X amount of bars and then put it uh, and then divide it by N. And you would find that actually, uh, you know, the transfer response of this filter is absolutely dismal. 
um, non-recursive filters incur a lag of n minus two over two. So for example, uh, if you were to take uh, a 10 bar SMA, uh, the approximate lag would be four and a half bars. And you know, this is important because essentially if you're using these signals uh, to generate instantaneous trading decisions, you want to make sure that you have the least amount of lag as possible. So the weighting moving average, the weighted moving average uh, is the most uh, awful uh, smoothing technique in that uh, essentially the lag of that uh, filter will be equivalent to the center of gravity of the weightings. Um, so that's obviously dynamically changing throughout time, but again, uh, definitely not our best option. Um, and I've included uh, my favorite uh, digital signal processing technique. Uh, this is actually uh, authored by a, a man named John Ellers, uh, one of my uh, you know, most, I guess, uh, researched uh, trading professionals. Uh, you know, I, I read, I've read all of his books uh, along with uh, Benoit Mandelbrot, uh, you know, in terms of uh, fractal theory uh, and digital signal processing. So, you know, this is uh, what John Ellers propose, proposes as the optimal uh, smoothing technique. Uh, and this, you know, this is a recursive filter. So it's only using the last bar uh, observed uh, to calculate the next bar. Um, in a comparable, uh, you know, if you're not into uh, filter design and you want to use a smoothing technique, um, you know, the exponential moving average uh, would suit just uh, very fine. Uh, there's minimal differences. Uh, but there is a small difference between the EMA and the super smoother. So now dealing with spectral dilation. Um, so this is, you know, all has to get at, you know, pinpointing the time scale that we're observing, right? So, you know, conventionally, uh, people often do not, uh, are not concerned about this. Um, and, you know, this is just something that doesn't cross a lot of people's minds. Um, the fact that, you know, there are larger cycles and smaller cycles um, that, are, that are influencing uh, current measurements of the time for period that you're concerned about. So the solution to this um, would actually be to use uh, something called a high pass filter and a low pass filter. And, you know, theoretically, really what you're doing here is you're pinpointing a specific range of which you're looking for uh, frequency components. So essentially, if you want to only look at frequency components that are less than 40 and more than 10, uh, that is made possible by a high pass and a low pass filter. So I've, I've included a small graph here uh, that shows an implementation of such. Uh, and you can see that this, uh, this indicator is centered around zero uh, and very uh, cleanly describes uh, cyclic patterns that are occurring in the underlying data. Uh, so this would be Euro USD uh, over the last month or so. So the next thing uh, would be the dominant cycle estimation, right? So this uh, gets into what's called an autocorrelation periodogram. And you can see in this animation on the side, um, we have two sets of uh, trigonometric waves. And you can see that the red one is moving uh, across, the, uh, across the graph and is coordinated to a certain period of lag. So you can see at the bottom, Essentially, what this is doing is it's correlating the red sine wave to the position of the blue sine wave at lag zero. And you can see that this uh, correlation actually gets dampened over time. Um, so, you know, you're not essentially favoring, um, you know, correlations that are happening so much later. Um, so, you know, in doing so, in doing this with uh, pricing data, uh, you know, you start, you essentially are doing the same thing. Uh, you're correlating the current position of the price to uh, every lag position between the defined ranges that you uh, preset. So essentially, you know, what's really useful about this is with the roofing filter, so, uh, you know, the, the indicator that I was discussing on the last slide, you know, that's something that can be used as a precursor to developing other indicators, essentially. So, so you're essentially pinpointing the cyclic motion at the scale that you're interested in trading. But with this, uh, with this indicator, um, this estimate of the dominant cycle, um, what essentially it's giving you is a dynamical uh, periodicity that you can plug into the other indicators that you create. So essentially, you can see here um, the range on this uh, cyclic indicator is between 10 and 50. So if we're at 40 um, in this indicator, that would indicate that essentially half of the cycle period is 20. 
So if at this period, um, I was interested in taking, I got a short signal from one of my indicators um, and I wanted to sell at the optimal right inflection point, that would mean that I would essentially set an exit, an automatic exit at the current uh, cyclic estimate, half of the current cyclic estimate. So 20 bars away is when I would um, sell, uh, sell or buy back my trade. So here's a, uh, just a quick visualization of how these actually uh, improve uh, you know, modern technical indicators. So you can see, you know, this is again, uh, your USD over the last month or so. Um, you can see the first indicator that uh, is on the screen is a classic stochastic oscillator. And you know, what you'll notice about this is there's, you know, there's the stochastic line and then there's the signal line. And every time the signal, uh, the signal line is crossing below, that means that we're looking to enter a short position. And the opposite is true when we're crossing above, right? So you can see that you know, the classic stochastic oscillator is often you know, very inconsistent and very reactive. Uh, and you know, this is kind of what I was getting at. I mean, this is exactly what I was getting at with spectral dilation um, is you can see, even though that we're on the hour four time scale right now, this indicator is picking up on cycles that are occurring at lower time scales. So it's giving us a, you know, a signal, uh, you know, for a time scale that we're not interested in at all. Um, so this is the classic stochastic oscillator. And then this is a, a very heavily modified stochastic oscillator. And you can see that, you know, this particular indicator, um, you know, over the last month or so, uh, and, you know, I've tested uh, obviously on many other things, but um, you can see how clear of a, a signal generation uh, that this indicator gives. Um, you know, it's not constantly whipsawing back and forth. Uh, it's not constantly crossing over and telling you to uh, buy, sell, buy, sell. Um, it gives you essentially, you know, a, a generalized estimate of the cyclic behavior at the observed times time scale. And it's, you know, limiting all the extreme values to the upper, um, and it's limiting all the lower extreme values to the lower. So we don't end up, you know, thinking that we have to exit trades, uh, you know, when we really don't actually have to. Um, so yeah, I mean, you can see that visually uh, with, the, uh, with this stochastic oscillator. And then the next one I wanted to talk about uh, was the moving average convergence divergence. And this is where you can really see the effects of lag. Um, so here we're using a 12 bar and a 26 bar, uh, simple moving average. Um, and we're essentially calculating the difference between the two. So here's my heavily modified version um, at the bottom. And you can see that the motion is somewhat similar. However, this modified version is able to pick up on reversal points by crossing this zero line much, much earlier than the classic moving average convergence divergence. You can see that in this case, the, the difference was almost uh, 12 bars, which is a massive difference. Um, and you can see that in this case, again, it's almost, uh, almost 10 bars. And you know, this essentially should be ringing true as to you know, how uh, faulty uh, you know, many uh, mainstream indicators actually are. So now I'm going to get into uh, back-tested performance. Um, so I've designed, I've designed uh, several, uh, you know, several dozen indicators uh, through remedying their uh, fundamental flaws from a DSP perspective. Um, so that what that means is, you know, I'll use, uh, you know, I'll, e I'll either create my own filters, uh, adapt uh, filters that are commonly used. But the whole point is that I'm using these techniques. Um, to essentially advance and uh, make much better indicators. Um, so I currently have five rules-based strategies. Uh, you know, rules-based strategy is one that, you know, is very simple. Uh, you know, one of, as, as Zach was uh, showing an example of earlier, um, you know, you're essentially just giving an entry rules, exit rules. Um, and what you'll see on the left is just a back test over 15 years, um, you know, several, uh, you know, more than 5,000 trades uh, among the five strategies. Uh, and each strategy was uh, given a 1% allocation. Um, and you can see how uh, you know, pretty relatively smooth uh, this curve is, uh, this increase uh, in portfolio value. So that's what's on the y-axis. Um, so obviously, you know, these, these numbers are uh, you know, uh, decent. I mean, they look surprising. Uh, but again, uh, you know, this is really just dependent on the weightings. Uh, and you know, I'd like to point out that obviously past performance is not indicative of future results. Um, and you'll see that the table below um, actually provides a Markowitz optimized 
allocation uh, of these uh, strategies. So essentially it's taking the mean uh, return and the variance uh, doing um, essentially uh, taking a covariance matrix between all the strategies uh, and then determining an optimal weighting um, for those strategies. So, you know, I found, I, I do this all in MetaTrader 5, the program that Zach was uh, using earlier. And, you know, I found that their sharp ratio estimates are not uh, accurate. Uh, you know, it was telling me that, uh, you know, each one of my strategies was roughly around a two sharp, um, but I, I, I was a little bit skeptical. So I calculated it myself uh, and I found that the optimized, uh, mean variance portfolio uh, has a sharp ratio nearing 1.5, 1 1.6. Um, and basically what this tells me is, you know, I'm currently, I currently have this trading live. Uh, I have my strategies trading live. But what this tells me is that uh, there seems to be promise uh, in this, I guess, area of research that I've done. Um, and I plan on, you know, obviously, you know, building more indicators, building more strategies, uh, you know, more detailed uh, and meaningful indicators. Um, and uh, what I'm doing is I'm actually gonna be transitioning uh, and working uh, with machine learning uh, and using these, in, uh, these indicators uh, as features for a future model. Um, so essentially that wraps up my presentation. I'm sorry if I went a little bit over, um, but right now uh, it seems that we're looking good in terms of time. So now, um, I would like to pass this on to Zach uh, in order to give an intro introduction uh, to Arez Katz, the CEO of Lucena Research. Thank you guys very much for listening. Thank you very much, Joe. That was, <laughs> that was very insightful. All right, um, so I wanna introduce you to Arez. He's the founder and CEO of Lucena Research, which is a quantitative investment firm that specializes in using machine learning techniques on alternative data. And we have worked together on a few quant strategies as well. So <laughs> it's my pleasure to introduce you to Arez. Well, thank you so much, uh, Zach, Joseph, Chris, um, and anyone else that's involved. It's been uh, really impressive to see, first of all, the presentation, the, the depth of knowledge and uh, the ease of uh, presenting and even coding in real time. Zach, that's really special. So uh, kudos for that. Uh, Joseph, this uh, this was a very interesting presentation. I have some thoughts um, and I can probably share with you afterwards. Um, but anyway, thanks everyone for giving me a chance to present tonight. I'm going to uh, follow a quick presentation that I created for this event. Hopefully you'll enjoy it and, um, and we'll go from there. So give me just a second here. Um, I'm gonna try and share, share my screen as well. One second. We'll get going here. Okay. Can you guys uh, see everything? Um, okay, the the front page. Okay. All right. If you don't see anything, and I'm going ahead of myself, uh, let me know. Uh, so again, uh, thank you all for joining um, and allowing me to present the application of big data and machine learning uh, to stock forecasting. Uh, before we get to the subject matter, I want just to provide uh, some background about myself, about the, my company as well. Uh, Center Research is a leader in computational finance and machine learning. Uh, we connect uh, big and leading uh, data providers with uh, buy side investment professionals, and we help them extract actionable insights from big data through model, uh, model portfolios, and other derived, uh, derived products. Um, my name is Eris Katz, I'm the CEO and founder, as Zach alluded to. And I'm really excited to present today uh, how we apply really deep uh, learning technology um, and deep neural network technology to investment uh, decision making. Uh, because I'm not a scientist myself, I'm really more of a technologist. Uh, I would like to, uh, my goal today is to, to really share with you the, the tactical considerations when someone applies uh, deep learning technology in the real world, okay? Because uh, Sometimes uh, the gap between science and, and the real world is rather large. And I wanna make sure people understand what it takes to really build a successful uh, investment strategy. Uh, my goal today that at the end of this presentation is to put the academic considerations uh, through the lenses of the uh, real world. And I'd like to leave a few minutes at the end for Q and A, uh, of course, for all of us, you know, there was some great uh, subject uh, uh, coverage here by, um, uh, Joseph and Zach, so I, I want to maybe maybe together we can answer some questions. Um, anyway, let's just get started. So um, 
if you, uh, unless you've been living uh, under a rock, <laughs> the trend uh, is moving rather rapidly in favor of quantitative investment and big data. According to alternativedata.org, and this is an older slide, uh, the buy side, uh, hedge funds, analysts, other investment professionals have been raising uh, the, their spend since 2016 by over 280%. And uh, we estimate that by this year, 2020, it'll be about $1.7 billion of expense, uh, about the sixfold of what has been spent just a few years ago. So things are moving rather, rather quickly in favor of quantitative analysis and big data consumption. You can see in this slide, uh, just to kind of further underscore the amount of, uh, of market share uh, from the entire investment you know, sphere that Quant Hedge Fund is taking. And you can see how the green bar is taking more and more ownership. This is 2018. I don't have one for present, but I can assure you that about 80% of, uh, of, of uh, investment is done through some form of quantitative analysis. Um, however, I like to also emphasize that uh, still, there are many of uh, misconceptional uh, misconceptions, and many quant funds are still failing to deliver on their premise. And uh, the reasons are varying, uh, either due to unrealistic expectations. People think that once you have a machine learning model, it should really win and succeed all the time, uh, or due to poor implementation and execution. And at the high level, there are really three types of uh, buy side consumers. There's a traditional deep value bottom up fundamentals that you know, have been traditional for many, many years, and they still have a pretty good strong hold for some of the larger funds out there. Then there are quant funds, and there's actually a mixture of the, of the above. So that's kind of the, the, the notion of what you see in the market. Uh, the advantage, of course, of quantitative uh, approach is that machines are not influenced by emotions. Uh, they have uh, a broader reach capacity and at a higher speed of execution and decision-making. But without predictive data, machine learning is completely uh, useless, right? Uh, the data is the bloodline of machine learning. And in order to realize its full potential, you have to understand how to manipulate and how to condition data for machine learning research. And I wanna talk about that a little bit today. So what we've done at Lucena, we spent a lot of time trying to um, kind of streamline the consumption of big data and make sure that we can actually have uh, a platform that can actually cohabitate multiple orthogonal data sets together. So they can coexist together as if they were coming from the same source. So you heard that today about the uh, price volume based data, which is technical analysis for the most part, and then the fractal um, um, patterns that uh, Joseph talked about is really based on price uh, data, but it can be really for any type of time, time series data. But think about other types of data that comes from other sources, for example, weather data, uh, insider buying and selling um, information about officers of companies that buy their own stock. You know, if somebody buys a boatload of their own stock and then the CEO of the company, I probably know something, I have a pretty strong confidence, I'm putting my money where my mouth is, and that could be a strong indication that of good things to, to, to come, right? Uh, whether you look at the social media sentiment, how you apply natural language processing to identify what the crowd thinks about uh, a topic or a company. So you combine all these things together and you create a multi-factor model that can really keep, be much more informed than just looking at price and history. And that's really the beauty of creating a successful uh, machine learning model. However, if you don't have a process to gather the data, understand its, its, its potency, if it's really predictive or not, uh, you're gonna be uh, running in circles, looking at different types of data. And there's many, many data sets out there uh, without actually getting uh, too much success because um, like anything else, um, a data can uh, look great, like just like a back test can look great if a vendor wants to sell it to you. And you have to have a pretty regimented process uh, by which you can evaluate if the data is indeed predictive. And we actually have done quite a bit of work in that uh, respect. So we have a platform, Zach knows because he has been interning with us last summer. Uh, that uh, takes data in, uh, in, in mass uh, quantities and very quickly we can identify through a um, systematic approach if it's predictive or not. But again, it's important really to understand um, the, the process by which uh, you go after uh, doing it. And I have to tell you, even in some of our customers that are the most sophisticated hedge funds out there, they don't need us to do the work for them. They hire us because they want to be able to fail fast. They want to be able to identify the data is really worthy of their quant time because spinning wheels on data that's not predictive 
it's just a waste of time and, and money for them. Anyway, we have a pretty comprehensive process that we go uh, through our evolution of uh, ingesting raw data, validating it <clears throat> through our, our platform. Of course, scrubbing, aggregating, mapping to symbology. Uh, how do you map uh, data that's not necessarily as, as specific to, to a stock into a stock? For example, look at weather data. You know, so weather can influence retail consumption. So how do you influence changes in weather patterns that can really influence consumer behavior habits in the retail sphere? So that's the kind of stuff you do with mapping to symbology. And of course, the notion of feature engineering, which is such an important thing. How do you take you know, the raw signal and create something that's gonna be more meaningful, uh, smoothing as uh, Joseph talked about before. You know, By the way, uh, some concepts to consider is uh, whole twinter, ARIMA. These are things that can allow you to take seasonality out of, uh, out of data over time and really smooth its behavior. So you can see uh, abnormal fluctuations that can be informative for a, uh, an impending price action, right? That's what we're looking for. And of course, once you have all these features together, um, and then they're all normalized and ranked and can really uh, behave similarly in, in, in the eye of the machine, you start up applying machine learning buildup. And I'll talk about that in just a second. Of course, uh, you saw some back tests. We have a pretty comprehensive back test simulation tool, but that's not important enough to have a back test. Uh, it's very important to have live trades. And I think both Zach and Joseph mentioned that they have been running uh, their portfolio live, and I'm sure the live is not going to be as sexy as a back test. It's just the nature um, of the beast. It's not going to get, <laughs> it, won't, it won't be better. It'll be probably worse because in, real, in the real world, you do have some considerations that you don't realize in a back test simulation. And I can talk about those, but uh, the really important thing is to take a back test and apply the same rules on a roll forward basis. And even, even before you reach, uh, you know, your risk capital, we have this concept called paper trading model portfolios. You can take a back test and forward uh, trade it, uh, you know, perpetually to see if uh, uh, you, know, you don't have any insertion of a, of, of a look ahead knowledge or historical knowledge that somehow even inadvertently influence your decision uh, with a back test. Anyway, uh, let me quickly get into the subject, the, the real uh, crux of uh, what I wanted to show you today, which is really how to go about uh, doing what, what we're doing. So one of the things that's really important uh, to be disciplined when um, you break down a data analysis uh, into a distinct time frames. You know, so there's no uh, overlap between those uh, multiple time frames. It's really four distinct time frames. You can see on the screen here between training, validation, uh, holdout, and future. Now, training is where you actually go into a um, um, iterative process by which you really try a lot of things to uh, maximize, um, you know, a model's uh, predictive capability. So you basically have the model kind of look uh, for various configurations uh, multiple factors and decide um, what the outcome should be. And you compare it to what the outcome is actually actually is. And if you are um, you know, off, you correct something, you uh, probably move around some of the parameters and you try it again until you get a very, pretty consistent uh, you know, prediction to um, actual um, outcome. Now, when you do it too many times, the risk here is that you get what you call selection bias, which essentially you tried so many permutations, you're gonna fall <laughs> completely by accident to something that's gonna really work well for you. Um, so how do you uh, ensure that this is not the case? You have a set of data called validation data that you basically tried the same model that worked so well and have been perfected for a known outcome against a yet uh, unknown data set called validation. And uh, basically you test it out. And for the most part, the first time, it's not gonna match. It's gonna probably fail miserably here. It's called overfitting, a pretty known concept in the machine learning research. Uh, the idea is to try and create a robust model that can really work really well in training as well as in, uh, in validation. So you try that multiple times, but again, if you try those uh, uh, you know, permutations too many times, you get to the same selection bias that you saw in the first time. And therefore, you really need to um, uh, have one set of data called the holdout time frame to once again test the training validation against yet another set of data to make sure that it is consistent. Once it is all consistent, it's not enough. You take uh, the approach of what we call forward uh, testing through model portfolio paper trading to make sure that everything uh, continues to work well. So anyway, that's the process that we take. Uh, with, and we are very, very disciplined about doing it to ensure that uh, we don't uh, insert some sort of a bias or future knowledge into the model. 
but what you see here on the bottom here is something called a rolling uh, uh, window by which you um, you don't have a set of uh, you know and the market is so fluid and things change so rapidly and the regime of the market changes so rapidly the idea is that you have to retrain the model based on the most recent data to ensure that it always adapts to uh, market changes so you can see here how we uh, train and validate, train and validate on a perpetual basis, a roll forward basis to ensure that we always account for changes in the market sentiment, uh, risk, uh, or factors that need to be uh, associated. This is just a very high schema of what we do uh, behind the scene to get a robust uh, model portfolio. And of course, uh, that goes into the holdout and the uh, future. You can see the same notion of uh, predict, um, training and predicting happens uh, on a roll for basis, even when you go live with a strategy, you don't have a set of factors that are steady and fixed. You always change them as you need to uh, using uh, the same routine that you've done when you researched. Anyway, um, this whole thing is uh, about data validation. Let's talk about uh, the machine learning aspect. So I'm not sure how many of you are you know, machine learning experts. I'm gonna start really slow with some conceptual high level and I'm gonna get a little bit more sophisticated as I go through it, but I'm not gonna get into the, the nitty gritty details of, uh, of deep learning technology. But uh, I think you're gonna get the concept of how do we apply some of these uh, uh, ideas into, into the real world, right? So let me kind of uh, go there right now. What you see is a simplified version of a deep learning model. Uh, as you can see, it's built on multiple layers of uh, neurons. Each neuron is connected uh, to all the neurons in the respective subsequent layer and all the way down to the output layer in which a decision is normally made. In this case, we are classifying an image of a cat uh, or, or a dog. And similar to how humans uh, learn, there are three main ingredients uh, to learning, right? There's a starting with an uneducated random selection then you measure how far you are from the desired outcome and you apply a corrective measure to get closer to the desired outcome. And then you try it again. It's quite amazing to see how our brains are able to classify images with such ease, right? You know, even babies can classify a picture of a cat or a dog with just a few observations. But uh, for us, it takes about millions and millions of images <laughs> uh, to train a machine with a very simple uh, classification of an image. So there's definitely something that is uh, uh, is a miss in the entire idea of uh, machine learning paradigm. However, the idea of classification uh, is to generalize uh, features or characteristics of an object so that it can then recognize or classify uh, when, when presented with a new set of uh, unseen data. So rather than having a picture of every single cat or dog in the world, you can compare the picture with something that you already have you look at the ingredients or the components that classify what a cat or a dog is, whether it's, uh, you know, has, a, has an ear, has, has a mouth, uh, whatever, uh, you know, signify each one of the objects and basically try to connect them together. Now, the ABC of uh, deep learning is, uh, deep neural network is basically, uh, the hello world basically is uh, image classification. Uh, in order to understand how deep learning really works, how it learns, take a simple uh, approach of, uh, of classifying a, a written digit. Um, and uh, the, the way uh, the fully connected uh, you know, uh, network is working here is, uh, is the following. Um, taking a small image of 28 by 28 pixels that represents an, a written uh, digit, it just, uh, if you can take all these pix pixels and classify them into a uh, single line that represents them all, uh, is one array of, uh, of, 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 of dots or of, of, uh, of pixels, basically. Uh, each one can be called a neuron, right? And each neuron is, is, a, is actually represented by the number, uh, let's say a zero to a number, zero to 100, which accounts for the intensity of the color, the gray scale in our case of the respective pixel. So in turn, the machine learns how to apply some of those, uh, uh, you know, gray scales and have a multiplier and aggregates these multiplications to get a value that's being then passed to the next layer of neurons. And the next layer of neurons has an activation function that basically tries to identify which pixels are really more meaningful to identify what is this image representing, right? And it goes all the way down to determine, so each layer basically uh, aggregates set of uh, the votes of all the pixels based on their intensity. And uh, at the end, we get a number, uh, some value. 
and uh, the value has to be representative of the image that we're trying to classify. And if we are off, we are trying to go with something called back propagation to go back and reset some of those classic, some of those multipliers to get to a number that's closer to the representation of the image. So that's kind of uh, how traditional, you know, deep learning, uh, fully connected layers uh, work. And I hope I'm not boring you with the details because it's important to go to the next slide and understand how this whole thing works together in, in machine learning for finance. So once you get to uh, the real world, you know, there's obviously uh, much more complex images than just uh, 28 by 28 pixels. You have uh, much larger uh, multicolor images uh, in depth and, and dimensions. And in order to uh, allow them to be classified effectively, you have uh, something called the CNN, Convolution Neural Network. It's multiple layers that come and precede the fully connected layers. And essentially what they do is they simplify a complex image to multiple layers. So you can see here, basically, we have some sort of extraction uh, of, uh, of, of information um, by which we um, essentially convolutional network, convolutional, convolutional, convolutional network is an extension of a traditional fully connected uh, deep neural network by which we are adding additional layers to downsample a large complex image. Um, if you can imagine in a real world, obviously, um, you know, a, a very complex image will take multiple layers to simplify what's really important for us to classify the object within the image. So um, essentially, um, if you look at the, the next slide, here you have a pretty complex image of, of, of a bird. And the idea is to um, take the dimensions of, of that bird into multiple channels, right? So you can see there's a RGB, red, green, and blue to create kind of uh, layers of, uh, of channels. And each channel basically goes through this uh, kernel that extracts what's meaningful within the image itself and uh, identifies uh, those uh, pixelated uh, you know, transformation to eventually go and, fed, and get fed into the multi-layer uh, neurons that I showed you in the previous slide. And this is working pretty well. This is not uh, something that's been uh, recently invented. Uh, if you think about it, um, uh, you know, uh, unlocking your phone with your face, uh, Facebook tagging, autonomous vehicle. These are things that are working today in the real world. And the question is, can you apply the same concept to the stock market? And the answer is yes. So let me show you kind of uh, what we've done here. So in a very similar fashion by which you have a complex uh, image structure um, with multiple layers for multiple channels uh, that are overlaid on top of each other to create a full image, we can actually take the very same concept and create uh, multiple images of time series representation of factors whether it's um, how PE ratio transformed over time or how volatility transformed over time, how the price had moved over time. Look at all these things together and you create multiple channels that represent the state of Apple at any given time. If you can use those as images and train the machine to say, hey, here's an image that is pretty complex, but it's got multiple layers of sub images and the outcome of that image was a buy uh, maybe you can actually generalize what level of inflection of time series uh, in these indicators uh, historically were um, pointing to a high degree of probability for a buy or sell signal. And you can train the machine to do that, right? So that's the idea to try and repurpose the same idea that's already working in production in the real world with image classification or object detection within images is to apply the same notion of uh, uh, classifying uh, binary classification of how a stock would behave using multiple orthogonal data sets together that are overlaid together. If you think about it, it makes sense. You know, if at the same time you have an analyst that just recommended the stock and the CEO just bought a boatload of that share, of those shares, and they just moved across its uh, 200 day moving average. And there is uh, a huge uh, spike of social media sentiment uh, in favor of that company. If these things happen together all at the same time, you can identify this is a good buying opportunity and the machine is able to do that in a much, much more robust way than a human. That's the idea behind applying machine learning uh, in the context of multiple data sets together. Anyway, uh, we, we tried this. We tried the same concept for, for a long time. We thought we had something really special. We tried it and it did work. Um, and, 
and I'll tell you, um, I'll tell you um, what we found. So we looked at the uh, uh, reason why it didn't work. And if you think about it, this is a sine wave representation of a time series, which kind of the same idea as each one of those time series. You see a lot of white space and there's only one dimensional really worth of data that's actually informative in this image. So you take a 64 by 64 um, image and really very few um, uh, pixels are really informative. There's a lot of white space that's not informative. And that was a difficult thing to overcome. When you compare that to an image that you see a beak, you can see a, a tail, you can see uh, you know, a fe a feather, whatever that may be to identify that this is a bird, um, you know, it's much richer representation, right? Um, so we wanted to find out if there's a way to transform these time series representation to a much richer representation. And we found out an interesting approach. Um, it's called um, um, uh, uh, GADF, and I'll talk about that in a second. But as you can see here on, on the left side is a sine wave, and on the right side is basically a richer representation of that uh, sine wave. And what we had found is that you take the uh, 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 Euclidean distance between two, every two points in, in that time series, you can have a nice uh, uh, visual representation that's much richer in content. And uh, we tried it against the sine wave because the sine wave is a really nice way to try uh, a concept because you know it has a repeatable pattern. And you can say, hey, if I buy every time, if I can train the machine to buy when you are at the lowest point and sell when you're at the highest point, I should have a really nice smooth outcome uh, and you can see that we train the machine to kind of learn from that time series using this uh, uh, recurrent point uh, transformation. And you can see uh, on the right, on, on the bottom here, the back test that shows uh, how well uh, we do compared to uh, S&P 500 benchmark. So that was very good for us to see that it actually works really well in theory against a single known um, time series a representation that's very predictive, right? It's very predictive in, in its nature. So we wanted to go uh, one step further and say, okay, let's just take the same concept now of multiple time series transformed through recurrent point. This is another method of, uh, of, of, transform, of transforming a single uh, dimension time series to a multiple dimension time series. And you can see here the same exact factor that we had before together cannot get trained against a convolutional neural network uh, structure all the way to a fully connected layers, all the way to a buy or sell signal. And guess what? It kind of worked really well. What you see here on the screen is TensorBoard. This is just one of the ways that uh, you can identify how fast the machine is learning uh, with uh, feeding it more and more data sets uh, over time. And you can see that over time, um, the, the accuracy gets better and better, which is a really great sign. The, the loss function gets smaller and smaller, which is also a great sign. And the precision, of course, uh, gets better over time. So again, as you start to train with more and more data, machine gets better and better and more accurate as you try to identify how these factors work together. And of course, uh, it's important to, uh, to, to, to note that uh, these values are, are, are in sample as well as out of sample. You know, TensorBoard gives you a chance to see how accurate you are uh, while you train and how that accuracy deteriorates as you go out of sample. And, and these are pretty good values. Um, so uh, going into uh, um, uh, production, I want to have one last thing before I show you the actual results of the back test uh, and, and the live strategies. Uh, what you see here is a couple of things that you have to remember. When you go out and you actually start looking at deploying your own strategies, whatever you use, it's really important to not take any factor as hard-coded. You don't put a stop loss at 4% or 3%. I heard Zach saying ATR really, really smart, average for range. Look at the, the idiosyncratic behavior of the stack at any given time and behave uh, according to that uh, condition in time because tomorrow there'll be another regime. You don't wanna apply 1% or 2% stop loss on a, uh, in, in a market that's going uh, completely hyperbolic, right? So you wanna have the ability to adjust your exit criteria based on the market. So you can see here how the ATR um, works here in dynamic labeling, for example, when I train a machine to say, should I buy Apple today or not? You know, putting a, a buy signal and expecting a 5% return or 2% return is kind of silly because it may not be relevant to how the stock behaves at this time. So you want to train to what it can actually achieve. 
So what you do is you create what we call based on the historical volatility of the stock. I know what the ranges are, what the upper and lower bound. I can take the first standard deviation of that lower and, uh, and upper and lower bound and then create some sort of a, a cone that represents where I think the, there's a high likelihood that the stock is going to reach that, um, that bound. And I'm gonna train to say, look, here's the bound that I expect the, the stock to behave and to move in the next uh, you know, 21 days or, or one month. Um, I'm gonna train my system, my model to say, find me the opportunities where I'm going to hit the upper bound before I hit the, the lower bound. So I, I know when to enter, I know when to exit, and I know when to have a stop loss if it goes against me, right? Because you want to have a higher likelihood of success by achieving those, uh, those goals. That's really a nice way to train the system to say, okay, dynamic labeling, dynamic um, outcome that you are trying to train this, the model to, to achieve. And also uh, talk about uh, the data conditioning. When you look at data, whether it's, uh, you know, moving averages with technical indicators or any other types of data, you know, the value of the data itself in a given time is completely um, um, not important because it's, as, as, uh, as Joseph said, it's probably already baked into the price, the efficient market hypothesis. Um, but if you can take a ranking transformation of the values, for example, P ratio of 18 means nothing. Uh, it, 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 it's a value that is representing already in the price. But how your P-E ratio, as it's ranked against your peer, moved over time. You were in, in position number five a week ago, and now you're in position number 25 a week later between zero and 100. So that's the range of positions. That's a meaningful change in how you rank those tips to your peers. And that's much more informative than the actual value itself. So keep that, um, that in, uh, in mind as well as you look at the, how to use data to, to find predictive models. Make sure it's ranked against your peers and how you transform that ranking over time, as well as dynamic labeling, dynamic, dynamic uh, conditioning for anything that's going on based on the market regime and in the idiosyncratic behavior of that stock or that asset uh, by itself. Anyway, this is the back test that uh, came out from Apple. Uh, basically what we've done here is uh, uh, made it a, uh, uh, if you held Apple all the time consistently, or if you went in and out based on our model over time, you can see here, this is the time frame that we measured um, against. Uh, so this is Apple uh, without us getting in and out. This is, uh, this is with our ability to come in and out uh, dynamically. And of course, uh, uh, the same thing happens uh, out of sample. This is in sample, this is out of sample. Now I wanna show you uh, uh, last thing before I stop here, and I'm hoping I'm not uh, taking too much of your time. Uh, I wanna show you uh, uh, what's the real, the real world look like. So I wanna go to our platform. This is, a, this is Quandes, this is a, our, our platform. And uh, we can see uh, you know, uh, real life portfolios at any given time. Uh, we can see that each portfolio has transactions that we simulate in paper trading. Uh, there are orders that are executed every day uh, or depending on how often we execute new orders. You can see here that these are the executions themselves. And you can see there's also a performance report. This is real live, this is not the back, this is actually perpetually traded. And actually it's synchronized dynamically with a live interactive broker's portfolio. So uh, this is actually, uh, what we do is we, we take the um, allocation of the portfolio and compare it to the NAV, the, the net asset value of the portfolio on the destination portfolio and make sure that the allocation are the same. And if they're not, we just execute trades to make sure that they are the same. So all the stop loss, all the conditions of allocation are done on our end. And we just synchronize it with the um, um, model portfolio. So you can, you know, just an example, this is a portfolio that's running since uh, February of this year before COVID. You can see how it totally um, alleviated, uh, alleviated the, the, the downfall uh, on March uh, of COVID. This is the S&P 500, this is the blue line here. And the orange line is actually strategy itself. You can see it's up uh, 50%, uh, almost 50%, 48.68% uh, to be exact. And this is actually as of, uh, as of today. So um, you can see it's very high, very low volatility and performs really well. This is one X, you can easily, um, you know, uh, extend it to uh, multiple, multiple um, uh, leverage if you want to get uh, more fancy. 
Anyway, I'm, I'm done here. Uh, any questions um, from anyone? I'm happy to answer and, uh, and I'll stop here. So I'll yield back to you, uh, Joseph, uh, Zach, um, Chris. <laughs> Thank you for your, for, for your time. Thank you so much for presenting. That was awesome. Uh, I actually did have one question uh, in terms of uh, the allocations uh, for any given individual strategy or you know a, a portfolio of multiple strategies. Uh, so how are you calculating these uh, these uh, allocations? Are you doing it on a rolling basis? Uh, and you know what kind of things are you looking to optimize for? Sure. So I'm going to show you. Um, uh, we have uh, a pretty. Um, uh, there's, there's multiple ways to allocate. So we look at the, uh, an event-based uh, uh, portfolio. You can see how often do you want to rebalance? What's your ultimate hold time before you give up on a position? You can have a conditional hold, which is like Zach's uh, uh, example. You can say, I, can, I want to enter a position where it satisfies my, my uh, MACD conditions, and I want to stay there as long as it satisfies them. So it's completely conditional. I like those much more than holding 21 days, you know, no matter what happens. But look at the allocation restriction. You can say, look, um, how much do you want to, uh, how, many, how many stocks, how many positions do you want to have in any given day? What's your maximum allocation size per day? What's your minimum allocation per equity? And what's the maximum? And I have to tell you, uh, in many cases, these are configurable uh, machine learning paradigm uh, elements that someone can train the machine. You know, what is the proper, allocation because you know you have signals that could be very sparse and you have a very highly concentrated portfolio you can actually have a one portfolio of one position if it's a futures that's the e-mini you're in so you have three uh, state classification you're either in long you're in short or you're in cash right which is definitely um, a position you want to be, be able to, to to keep that in mind as you train the system because uh, you want to enter only high conviction. You don't want to be always in a position um, and, and, and incur, uh, you know, incur uh, losses. So anyway, um, the allocation is really, really important. I want to just tell you there's other paradigms. I don't know if you heard of what they call Martingale and other type of uh, allocations. Essentially, uh, as you get into more uh, active trading, you can go into what we call a Martingale, which is basically as you uh, lose um, an entry of a, of a position, you double your allocation for the next time, almost like a you know black shawl uh, simulation. Uh, because if you do have uh, the, the 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 power of science in your favor, you'll end up winning more than losing. So the idea is how to maximize your winners as opposed to your losers. You start to double down on your on your bets per se or your entries. And that's another way of training a system to really maximize its ability to, uh, to succeed without wiping you completely out. So there's a whole bunch of uh, paradigms about how many levels of martingales do you, do you want to take and at what level uh, you stop and you start from scratch. There's a whole bunch of stuff that uh, goes around, around that. But allocation is really important. Stop loss uh, conditions is really important as well. Um, of course, uh, the, inch, the, the notion of, uh, of uh, what do you target? What's your labeling approach? There's a whole paradigm about how do you label? How do you uh, overcome something called um, um, class imbalance? You have uh, more buyers and sellers, more sellers and buyers. How do you train for that effectively? And, and we do all of, all of that. It's a whole series of lessons uh, of, of their own. <laughs> Any other questions from anyone else? Thanks for staying uh, up so late. <laughs> I have a question from Dom, so I'm gonna un unmute you, Dom. You can turn it. Hey, in. how's it going? Uh, I really enjoyed the presentation, um, and I just had a, a quick question on how you choose your um, your target variables for um, a model like this. I think maybe um, mm -hmm. you might have heard from from Zach, but we both worked on a paper involving like similar convolutional neural networks. Um, and we also were able to reach like an out of sample accuracy of around 68% or something like that. Um, you know, That's since writing good. that paper, I've, I thought that, you know, these kind of results are just a product of, you know, the model being too complex and sort of like a higher level overfitting, not even on the training data, but on the test data. I imagine like you, you take oh. that on the, um, 
you, you take care of that on the out of sample, um, uh, like, you know, look, look forward tests. Um, but I, I, I also wanted to gauge your thoughts on, you know, that idea, like why use, you know, a massive black box model if your alternative data features are, you know, sufficiently predictive? What if, you know, whoever you sell the model to says, well, why is it misperforming today? You know, I, I imagine there's That's a disadvantage of not being able to point to like the particular um, thing there. Yeah, so that is a very good question. Is something I wanted to ask about. So uh, let, me, uh, let me address those. So um, number one, you're absolutely right. Uh, there's really no need for our technology, for most strategies, to use a sophisticated deep learning type of model oh, such as uh, <laughs> such as uh, um, um, you know uh, uh, deep uh, deep learning. Uh, we can use uh, uh, anything uh, like uh, um, you know um, SVM or KNN or even linear regression, and in many cases it will be sufficient. And the reason is because it's such a noisy uh, market. It's very hard to really distill information. If you really get to a sophisticated multi-factor model, you are very likely to be overfitting. Okay, so so I, I said that. So one of the ways to do that in the in the in the in the, w the real world is creating uh, lots and lots and lots of what we call um, simple uh, weak models that can be ensembled together. And the whole thing of ensembling votes. Almost like you're taking a jury of, uh, of peers and they all have to vote uh, for a given stock and you aggregate the number of votes. Uh, you have to find uncorrelated uh, models, uh, very much like Zach showed in the first uh, slide that he was using a correlation matrix to find multiple strategies that are uncorrelated. In the same way, you can actually take multiple models that can vote on the same constituents universe and you aggregate the votes. Now, making an all equally weighted is, is not the right way. You want to basically weigh the votes that have been more accurate recently, higher than votes that have been less accurate. So we, so basically what's happening, you create some sort of a smooth uh, uh, transform transformation of uh, what model is really meaningful for any given market regime. It's completely dynamic and that's the beauty of it. So uh, we've done a lot of that. Uh, use a genetic algorithm to uh, build models uh, using uh, a natural selection process, which is a very nice, interesting process as well. But there's many ways to do a feature importance to see what factors are going to be more important than others. Again, train the models, make sure they work for a given rocket regime and have the ability to, to shift between them. However, look, um, uh, as you get more and more data and uh, the market becomes more and more competitive, you have to have an upper leg on your competition. And it's going to be based on how sophisticated your technology is going to be. Not for the sake of being just complete, complicated and complex, but having the competitive edge that others do not have, uh, where you can actually uh, create a competitive advantage. Sometimes it's a function of, uh, of data. Sometimes it's a function of uh, machine learning. But at the end of the day, it has to be both, right? So that's, uh, that's what we are advocating. Yeah, so I've heard Any a lot other? about these, like um, the bagging and the boosting, um, Ada boosting yeah. models, and I, mm -hmm. I do think th those are kind of, um, uh, I guess, a, a way to use like more simple models to do this thing. I, I guess I yeah. just want to have a clarifying point there. Like you said, there were, you require models that have um, that are not correlated. Um, by that, do you mean that they're not perfectly correlated? Or that they are, you know, I guess the more away from perfectly correlated, the better. But is that the minimum constraint? Um, for well, this? think about it. You want to have uh, you want to have uh, models that vote for the same constituent for different reasons. Otherwise, you're not getting any benefit from having um, the ensemble, right? So you want to have right. uh, different factors, for example, that could be responsible for a vote for Apple and other factors from other models, both for Apple as well, that's a much stronger signal than having the same model twice voting for Apple. Makes sense. Yeah, thank you. Sure, any other questions? I'm here, I mean, I can be here as long as you guys uh, can stay up. I guess you have some homework and uh, or classes, whatever, <laughs> but I'm happy to uh, answer any other questions you may have. And if you wanna reach out to me um, offline, I'm happy to do it as well.
Well, that was a great presentation. Uh, I'd like to thank all the presenters, including uh, Mr. Arez, Zach, uh, and our representative from MMI. Uh, so I think that uh, unless anyone has any other questions, uh, we can uh, conclude our meeting here. Uh, I had a great time. It was very educational. Um, I hope everyone else did as well. Um, we'll be, uh, Dominic just raised his hand, it seems. Yes, Dominic. Uh, yeah, just one more question before we wrap up. Um, this this uh, web-based like platform, is that something you guys build in-house or is it something you purchase from a, like a third-party provider? No, we build it in house. Um, that's the competitive advantage that we have here. We have a really comprehensive platform, not just for what you'll see here, uh, which is basically the back to simulation. We have an optimizer, a mean variance optimization, a, a forecasting technology, an event signal technology. Um, there's a lot of stuff here, um, but it's really more for fast prototyping. Our quants take that and uh, go to the next level with accurate, you know, with uh, flexibility when they go into the code behind it. Um, what it does have the ability is to see in real time, you know, during market hours, how the portfolio is ex executing. So it kind of puts a little picture behind the science to kind of give people, our uh, customers, our, our, our prospects, uh, a clearer view of what we are delivering to them. And I guess, how do you know, like, where to, um, cause I know like, at, uh, when I was working at Virtu, you know, a lot of the quants, they, work on um, like robust like simulation architectures. Um, mm -hmm. And, you know, so I imagine this is something you could develop internally and factor into this platform. Um, but, you know, obviously something like that is a really high cost, you know, long-term project. And so I'm just curious, like, you know, how do you weigh the, the costs and benefits, you know, as the CEO, like of well, do we want to maybe build out our own paper trading, you know, functionality? Do we want to, you know, build out our own back testing engine, or do we, you know, offshoot to some other provider of these? Sure, sure. That's a good. Uh, it's a good question. So, you know, we've been this. We've been in this since seven years. That's more of a business decision than uh, than a scientific decision. But essentially, um, one of the biggest hurdle for us to get market ad adoption, to get people to believe in what we're doing, because it was a little bit uh, of a left field for the last, you know, two years it changed, it became more mainstream. But, you know, in the beginning, I was going to different shops to tell them about this great technology we have. And I was getting kicked out of the office very quickly. Uh, <laughs> so uh, nobody believed in machine learning. And because for good reasons, you know, many of the folks that have been the early adopters have not been successful. A lot of companies shut down, huge companies shut down. So uh, we decided to have what we call a defensible mechanism to show people and have as much exposure. This is not a black box. We show people clearly, I'll give you an example. We show clearly what factors are being used, what transactions we've executed. You know, it's very, very comprehensive in the context of that. So you can see, for example, here's what a backlist looks like, okay? So I'm gonna go and open up the, the full report. And uh, you can see all the attributions, you know, how it's doing over time. It's pretty standard. But then you get into uh, the actual trades themselves, which we can expose as well. But you can see, for example, what factors were being used in any given uh, retraining period. So you can see kind of what it's being used, what it's using in any type of, uh, of, of time frame, And uh, you can see how it's performing over time where all the factors, sharp ratio, Sortino ratio, max drawdown, alpha, standard deviation, tracking error, you know, we capture it all and make it available to you right there and then. Uh, and of course, not to mention that we give you a complete uh, transaction history of all the buys and sells of the, uh, of the strategy. By the way, you can see, you see those numbers here? It's POM, it's Pepco Holding, which is no longer an existing company. It's a dead company, but you can see how we market with historical date and timestamp when it actually dies. So we can actually account for what we call survivorship uh, uh, bias. Uh, in, our, in our data. So we account for dead stocks. If you don't do that, by the way, you would get a very favorable uh, back test um, that only shows the, the current stocks. So you look, look at the Russell 1000 today or S&P 500 right today. If you go back 10 years, about half the constituents are not the same, you know, are, are different constituents. Um, you're going to basically create a favorable outcome that's completely unsubstantiated because you only use the surviving stocks. So again, all these things are defensible 
by getting slapped in the face a couple of times from smart smart guys in hedge funds and uh, learning how to defend our, our position. So it was important for us as a business to do that, but you're right, you can't do everything. But uh, this is really, uh, we have some pretty strong talent and uh, we were able to build a com comprehensive uh, kind of brokerage uh, simulation. And of course the connectivity to the fixed API to execute trades on uh, Ninja 8, uh, Interactive Brokers or Goldman uh, Prime. I mean, they're all fair game for us. Cool, thank you. I just have sure. another quick question. Um, so from my understanding uh, through Zach, uh, Lucena is a fund that employs a relatively small amount of people, um, you know, compared to uh, some of the other big players uh, within the industry. And I was just curious to hear your thoughts on, you know, how that uh, helps you, you know, on a day-to-day -day basis, uh, you know, how, you know, being nimble uh, within such a, uh, a market full of, you know, these big players with thousands of employees, uh, how, what advantages and disadvantages come along with that? Yeah, yeah. so uh, uh, number one, uh, that's gonna change very quickly now because we, we just got a, a very large investor uh, who is putting uh, a lot of money behind the company, uh, which would allow us to hire um, um, C-level talent as well as uh, underlying quants and data scientists. Um, so we're not small uh, by choice, although we don't wanna be uh, inefficiently big, right? So the idea is to hire very few talented people. If you think about when you go to these big shops and I've been working for large companies before, there's really a group of uh, maybe hundreds of quants, but there's really one, two, maybe five that really are calling the shots. The others are just kind of what you call, um, you know, hard labor kind of uh, <laughs> employees. They do the hard stuff that's not necessarily innovative, but there's really a handful of people that, that are good. You know, my goal is to find, to spot these people that can actually be those uh, leaders and make a group of uh, like-minded, uh, uh, excellent, uh, talented people work together. Uh, that's for me what's exciting. You know, I, I have very little patience to people who, who don't get it, uh, but I have a lot of admiration to people who actually understand uh, and get the point and, uh, and, and, and are self-driven and, and really wanna, you know, just love, love the subject matter, uh, such as you guys, you know, this is kind of uh, where, where I see, uh, you know, our future as a business. So for us, it's important to be uh, larger than what we are now, obviously. We only have uh, seven people now in total. So it's a really small company, uh, but we have huge customers. Think yeah. about uh, companies like Equifax, ADP, IBM. Uh, look at Goldman Sachs, um, JP Morgan, Citigroup. I mean, these are companies that have used us or are using us currently uh, we have a lot of small companies that use us that nobody have heard of. These are family offices, small hedge fund that just emerging hedge fund that just got a little bit of funding. Um, but uh, um, the reason they use us because we have something that would be much more expensive for them to do in house or to go some, somewhere else and it won't be as good. So, so and, and, and time to market is really important. We already have it built. Uh, so, uh, so that's why we think we have a very, um, I would call it unfair competitive advantage, right? We, we have some that others do not have that make it, uh, make them see, they can say, geez, man, I'm gonna be stupid not to use these guys because they really have everything I need and they're much cheaper. So that's, that's, that's the business side of uh, the angle side of, uh, of the business. That's awesome. That's great. Uh, does anyone else have any other questions uh, before we wrap up and uh, give a great thank you to Arez? I saw a hand uh, uh, raised before and uh, kind of came back down. So don't be shy. If you have any questions, I'm happy to, happy to answer. No problem. Zach, would you like to give uh, some closing remarks perhaps? Yeah, uh, thank you so much, um, Arez, for for coming. This has been a huge honor. I, I don't want to ask too many questions because I can grill you in person later. <laughs> but <laughs> no problem. Yeah, this has been very, very revealing. I liked uh, you talked about constantly uh, going through the validation process, updating your algorithm, where you get all the features, uh, what machine learning techniques are used. So these are all very important things uh, for industry professionals to know. So thank you very much. Uh, thank you for everyone for coming. We're honored. Uh, NYU 
uh, Yumish QIS is coming, uh, Wharton, uh, Undergraduate Finance Council. So thank, thank everyone for coming and have a good night. Have a good night, everyone. Bye-bye.